Hello and welcome back to the spreadsheet test brought to you by Looks Good on Paper. As ever, I'm your host, Felix Pate. Uh, I'm joined by another guest today. Um, I've always been interested in analytics across a wide range of sports and how I can translate those ideas to football. So I'm delighted uh, to be joined today by someone in the, the sphere of cricket analytics, Dan West. And Dan, thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me, Felix. Looking forward to doing this. Yeah, it's going to be brilliant. Um, so, Dan, you are a, a cricket data analyst. You work for uh, Leicestershire County Cricket Club and uh, Birmingham Phoenix in the 100. Do you just want to go into a little bit about what you do and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I've had a really quite interesting background. So, originally, um, I've always been interested in numbers from a young age. I mean, I can remember like when I was about eight or nine years old, kind of, looking at averages non-stop throughout weekends and stuff in, you know, supplements of weekend newspapers and things like that, taking them on holidays, simulating matches and stuff. And always been really maths and sport orientated. So kind of managed to turn what was just a hobby from a young age into, into something of a career, which is, you know, I'm really fortunate to do that, to be able to do something that I love every day is just incredible. Um, so from, from a career basis, I, I done a degree in accounting and finance. So again, numbers, um, I worked in the gambling industry for quite a long period of time, um, mainly off my own back in terms of like, so stuff like online poker, playing online poker full time, um, things like that. I think there's a lot of parallels actually between online poker and, and data analytics as it happens. So I think, I think we're going to talk about, um, sort of the state of analytics in in cricket in in you know in the future of this podcast but you can compare this to poker quite well because in 2003 poker was still kind of quite small online poker in particular and then chris moneymaker won the world series of poker when he uh played an online satellite to get into the main event so he turned like a cheap online entry won that tournament to get a seat in the ten thousand dollar buy-in main event of world series of poker and then won the World Series of Poker for like millions of dollars. And he showed that that was possible. And obviously his name was like, as a moneymaker, as his surname was just like, you couldn't write a better headline than that mm-hmm. in terms of advertising the sport. Well, sport, but you know you know what I mean. And um, uh, it just exploded. And from, I mean, I, st- I can't remember when I started, but it would have been not far off then. And at the, at the start, players were just horrible they were really bad you, they used to get lucky against you sometimes but they had no chance of beating you in the long run and mm-hmm. um the long run you might say would be about thirty thousand hands at a given stake before you could work out if you're profitable at that level for example and 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 there's so many parallels like i said because now poker is full of shocks game theory experts things like that the, the market got completely saturated in mm-hmm. here the bad players kind of disappeared. Now, if you're playing like a six max table, there might be five competent or very competent players, even at low stakes, five competent players and one bad player. And every competent player is fully aware of the fact that who the one bad player is and they're trying to exploit them. They've all got software on their computer, heads up displays and stuff like that. So so they're fully aware of who their primary target is. And, and the, the bad players don't exist anymore. And I think that there's a lot of parallels with, with cricket because cricket doesn't at the moment it's probably before where Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker all those years ago almost 20 years ago and football's probably maybe 2010-ish maybe if you like whereas cricket's like 2002-ish uh, and in terms of the poker cycle and probably both both areas are still yet to reach kind of maximum efficiency and saturation and I was mentioned about the sort of sample size of hands as well. Well, that's super useful in terms of um, cricket data samples as well, because it taught me that you can't deal with small sample sizes, which a lot of analysts do do. And I feel that that's a point of difference for me because I, I don't trust those small, numbers, small, small sample sizes. I try and cross-reference those smaller sample sizes with like bigger population tendencies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, and other people don't do that. And I feel that that really helps me with matchups, which I think we can talk about a bit later on as well. Mm-hmm. And finally, the other area that I think that there's a lot of similarities with poker and, and, cr- and cricket in any strategy in sport really is that the meta game what they call the meta game so not necessarily taking like a standard line against someone that you play on a regular basis 
and deviating from perhaps perfect strategy or ABC strategy, if you like, and then going, doing something different because you're trying to create an edge in the future. And, and again, there's, there's strategies that you can do in, that, like that in cricket as well, a lot of parallels. So poker was a really good background for me to get into sports analytics. And probably about, I guess, about five years ago, I started building cricket databases because, as I said earlier, I've always been a massive fan of cricket. I watch it on TV all the time. And I kind of realised that commentators don't really have a clue what they're talking about and teams are making bad decisions and stuff like that. So I thought, all right, I'll build a database. And then that kind of piqued my interest even more and kind of realised this. there was a situation developed where a commentator would be saying something on TV and I'd be like, no, that's actually the complete opposite of, of what the data is saying. Mm-hmm. So then I thought, okay, well, maybe I can help these commentators. I can help teams to, to make better decisions. And so I set up a, set up a kind of business doing that, right? Did a lot of um, free articles online, tried to build a bit of a social media presence. And it was a really difficult process. So I didn't realise how difficult it would be. And to be brutally honest with you, if I did know in advance how difficult it would be, I probably wouldn't have bothered. I would have been better off putting my time to a different industry. Um, uh, but now I'm there, it's it's kind of a bit more rewarding. But the, the, the legwork that I've had to put into getting roles and stuff has been incredible. Um, I, I can remember the days where I was sending like, 100 plus messages to different various decision makers captains wow. players coaches directors of cricket you name it and 95 percent of them we wouldn't even give you the courtesy of reply so so and then the rest of them would be like no that's all right thanks and, uh, and so it was it was really really difficult process and then i kind of ended up doing a little bit of consultancy work for a couple of teams but the rates weren't great in terms of day rates they're, they're fine but obviously, if you're only doing a day rate a few days a year or something like that, it's 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 not going to pay the bills. No. So so having, and then eventually I got the Birmingham Phoenix role. Let me try and work that one out. It would have been spring of 2019. Um, but we haven't actually played a match yet. No. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, so obviously we did the draft in October 2019, uh, which was fantastic experience really really great cool. to watch as well i must yeah. say i watched the whole thing on tv and it was really good to see that in an english sport for the first time exactly that this first cricket draft in the uk which is just awesome and, and obviously we're really looking forward to playing the tournament and then covid hit so the tournament got delayed so we've actually done two drafts we haven't played a match yet so we did the the mini draft at the end of last year uh no sorry February, was it february this year sorry and um just we we only needed three players we we released three and we picked, picked three new players up um so we, we had quite limited activity in that few teams had, i think manchester had needed like 10 players mm-hmm. uh, so they kind of dominated that mini draft um but yeah that was that was great as well we did all that on zoom though so there wasn't any glitzy sky sports studios or anything like that um so and then the tournament starts in sort of third week of July, I think. So yeah, can't wait for that. And that was that 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 was kind of my first introduction to working a lot more closely with a team. And then July last year, uh, I got the role at Leicester, which was uh, I've, I've been speaking to Paul Nixon for for a while. He's head coach at Leicester. Uh, he he was really interested in in the side of things that I could bring. And um, you know, we chatted informally for quite a long time, uh, kind of became mates through WhatsApp or whatever. And um, then they got a new CEO, Sean Jarvis, who was originally uh, last at Huddersfield FC uh, as commercial manager, I think. So um, he he came in as CEO at Leicester and I had a meeting with them and, and, and they wanted to be forward with a more of a sort of analytics driven approach, which is fantastic. And I love working there. So I so started in July last year, hit the ground running straight away pretty much. And um, We've got a big project on our hands because we've got one of the lowest budgets, if not the lowest budget, out of the 18 first class counties. Um, if you look at the historical league tables, uh, Leicestershire don't rank very well. We've often come bottom uh, in just like 2017, 2018, 2019. Even before then, there was one year, I think it was, might be 2016, and they didn't even win a match for the whole season. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's, we're starting from quite a low base. It's probably going to be, yeah. We've got ambitions. We're really ambitious, um, but 
realistically, it's probably going to be you know, a fairly long term project, uh, certainly to get us up to where I think we could be. Um, but by the same token as well, it's, it's, it's interesting because we can build something from the bottom and hopefully take us to the top. And I'm really strong on the fact that there's a lot of market inefficiencies in cricket. And it's allowing me to kind of try and exploit those market inefficiencies or to help exploit those market inefficiencies uh, from the bottom and then show that we can do it at the top as well. And, and as a project, I think that's absolutely perfect. And I, and I firmly believe that the, the kind of smaller teams with the lower budgets can actually probably benefit more from analytics than some of the richer teams who can just take their pick of the better players anyway. Whereas a team, team like Leicestershire, they have to really make sure that every pound that they spend produces an ROI. So if, 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 if we can pick up a player for half the salary of someone else and that player produces more than that player who's on double their money, then we've had a win. And, and, that, and that's kind of how we have to operate, I think, at least in the short term. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's a, a fascinating journey that you've described there. Um, I think it draws a lot of parallels with what we're seeing in the football analytics space. People having to really graft, put out a lot of public work um, for no compensation, blog in, um, put a lot of data visualizations as well on Twitter at the moment. And then slowly but surely people getting part-time roles, but it's completely cutthroat. People are, are let go quite often. It's such a competitive industry to get into. I can imagine probably even more so. Um, than cricket yeah. and well, yeah like context there as well so as far as I know out of the 18 first class county teams I'm the only analyst that works specifically on recruitment wow yeah because yeah, I, I think that's that's probably the the biggest thing that it's being used for in football at the moment and I think there's definitely a lot more areas that it's not being used for enough yet I think everyone's putting their eggs a little bit too much in the recruitment basket um, and it's it is leading to a little bit of saturation, um, but hopefully that that turns around pretty soon. Like you say, I think it definitely has a benefit for the smaller low budget clubs. Um, it's the classic money ball David and Goliath yeah. story. Um, I mean, I'm a I'm a Yorkshire fan, so I've I've enjoyed a little a little bit of success because I've never enjoyed success with my football team. But I've I've seen as win county championships. I've also seen as waste money and waste resources mm -hmm. in the t20 blast over a number of years you know going regularly but seeing little end product of it and you see teams like leicestershire and north Hants on far far smaller budgets than yorkshire operating on winning finals days and you're wondering where are the inefficiencies coming from that yorkshire with all those resources mm -hmm. as one of the historically biggest counties um aren't exploiting just to go back on something you mentioned um, when you first started going into this, you said you started collating your own databases. Um, mm -hmm. I put a poll out on Twitter yesterday asking the football analytics uh, sphere, uh, how many of them collect their own data or do they just rely on third-party vendors? Do they do a mixture of both? I'm, I've always been someone who's tried to collect really basic data but then feed it into my own models and algorithms to try and get unique insights out of it that no one else is able to get. Yep. How important do you feel that collecting your own data is rather than relying on those third party vendors when sometimes, you know, the definitions and the accuracy aren't always the clearest. Yeah. I think it's super important for what I want to do, what I, what I want to achieve. I couldn't achieve what I wanted to do without my, basic database which has got the performances of every player in t20 over a long period of time it's split by a year split by tournaments stuff like that i couldn't and you can't get that information on any commercial website no. you can't pay for it you can't get it for free so and i can like for example like nico paul nixon our coach he'll 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 you know he's always texting me saying oh what do you think about this player what do you think about that player this guy might be available whatever and I can just flip that database up on my computer and give him bullet points straight away of, of positives, negatives, stuff like that. And it allows us not just to recruit well, but to avoid bad recruitment as well, which I think is actually probably half the battle a lot of the time. Um, certainly with cricket teams, I think being quite blunt, they, they, 
they, there is a lot of bad recruitment in cricket teams and and even if you can just avoid bad recruitment then then that's that's a big win over most of the opposition so yeah having that my own database that i can just flick up and 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 refer to whenever necessary i'll, you know, I'll sit in and i'll sit in uh and you know, have it. I have it to hand in like a draft room or something like that. That I can just, I can just flip to if, if the draft goes a certain way. We can then look at that and say, okay, well, what about this? What about that? This player, what's his numbers? Just put it up straight away. Yeah. And that's is perfect for what I want. There's stuff that I, I'll use in terms of like this freely available stuff as well. But it's just to cross reference or to find a different side of another angle to things. But I couldn't do what I do without my own database. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's probably the same in cricket and in football. There's a lot of numbers without context and everyone's got access to uh, a lot of basic data, certainly on kind of the biggest teams now. And it's what are you actually doing with those numbers? Can you add those extra layers that add the context? Who you know? Can you adjust for how strong the opposition were, how strong your yeah. own team are? Um I, I mean, the thing that I've always hoped differentiates um, my data set from a lot out there is I want to develop something that can look at historical priors so you can see young up-and-coming players coming through and you can compare them to players of the past and see what kind of trajectories they might be on. And that mm. hopefully aids a lot in uh, decision-making. And, and like you say, there's there's only really scraping the surface with the, the data that's out there and by collecting your own, adding that context, you really are adding a, a whole lot more detail and hopefully adding a lot more value to decision makers within clubs. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting you mentioned about those kind of historical benchmarks of, of players in the past as well, because that's something that I've done a lot of work towards as well. So, um, for example, without going into massive detail, I'll, I'll know if a player hit certain benchmarks by the age of 22 in 2020 that's generally means that they'll play a good level of international cricket yeah in the future so i can i can then profile the the high potential players for the future but the difficulty with cricket compared to football is there's no transfer fees no which is a massive problem because i think uh, for me, I would absolutely love transfer fees in cricket because I think that with good recruitment, you could just you would be able to turn a, a low budget team into the best team in the country in a couple yeah. of years, basically, because team other teams would make so many mistakes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that's the one. That's the one drawback. So I, I've got this list of high potential players, but a lot of the time I can't necessarily act on it because. Yeah. We're only allowed two overseas players per tournament, so there's there's not quite that freedom of movement and freedom of selection that you have in football, and and also like I say no transfer fees, so I can't look to try and identify a hidden gem in the reserve somewhere, which which there are some of, uh, and I'm sure and, and get them for for free or dirt cheap, and then sell them for millions of pounds in a year's time because that model model doesn't work like that in cricket so the, the, there's there's problems with it as well but yeah identifying certainly domestic players with high potential is massive and and, and a, a big part of what i do yeah and do you think I, i've noticed this problem in football and be interesting to hear your perspective on in cricket do you think there's somewhat of a disconnect sometimes between statistics that you see commonly used versus ones that are actually meaningful i, I mean in football you see loads of stuff about uh, possession numbers, for example, are on number of tackles. And the question I always ask is, well, does that actually mean it? Is that actually going to help contribute towards a team winning more games if your yeah. midfield is running more than uh, the other team? Do you see a lot of that in cricket as well? Ridiculous amounts. So, so um, I'll give you some context. So, like, there might be an England test match on the TV, right? And you'll get someone on Twitter, some statistician who will, will post words to the effect of that was the sixth fastest hundred in England on a Tuesday or something like that but the, realistically what, what benefit does anyone have mm -hmm. from that information it's completely meaningless so so when I see that I just like that's nice but but you're more likely to get a job providing stats like that than you are providing analytics with future predictive value it's, it's a crazy industry just just bite-sized content I guess is the thing that's driving the social media engagements and it, it is frustrating i agree 
Yeah, this, uh, so so obviously everything I provide, all the insight I provide, I try and have that predictive value or, or some uh, some form of information that we can act on in the future. Whereas obviously knowing that someone scored the sixth fastest century in England on a Tuesday <laughs> provides no 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 predictive value whatsoever. So there's, there's a big difference between all that. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely something that I'm hoping comes to the fore in sports analytics in general is that trend towards less away from the descriptive um and more towards the predictive and being able to project future outputs from players um so going back to you mentioned about the parallels between poker uh, and cricket and the state that you think cricket in is compared to poker how how much do you think firstly cricket has been able to come on in the last kind of five to ten years and how much more do you think it's got to go? Where are the, the gaps that still need filling before we're, we're seeing a, a bigger analytics boom in cricket as you were? Okay, so there's a, quite a few kind of sub-questions in those sub-areas that I think are really worth discussing, actually. Yeah. Uh, to, be, to give a real instant summary, I would say, if you're looking at how saturated cricket is with analytics, I would say about two out of ten. Um, I think that the casual fan thinks that it's a lot more data driven than it actually is but having experienced the industry and 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 one of the benefits of freelancing at a few other teams in the past was that I kind of know how a bit about how they operate and 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 their processes and stuff like that so that that's been super useful in terms of informing my current roles and I don't think it's remotely close to maximum efficiency or, or or anywhere near that most teams won't, like I said, won't use recruitment in their, in their so analytics in their recruitment in yeah. the, as a UK county. You will, every team in a draft will say that they do it, but I'm not convinced that the recruitment analyst, if they have one, will have a massive impact in their decision making. I would say, I'd be surprised if more than about 10% of teams really listen to their recruitment analyst in terms of did the vast majority of the things that he's recommending. Do you think uh, it's a little bit of a FOMO, fear of missing out? I think it's just, no, I think that there's, and I guess maybe there's a similar situation in football, is that I think that there's too much reliance given to the opinions of people who have played the game. Uh, okay. Like the 50 caps for your country merchants, because they played for years and they were really high profile and they're successful as a player. So uh, they must know what they're talking about, right? Mm. Um, when actually they they don't really have a clue what they're talking about because, for example, you look at most coaches or or ex players who are in the media, most of them either didn't play T Twenty cricket or they played it right at the start when uh, the early years, and then the first match of T Twenty cricket, I think it was in like two thousand and three, yeah, was the, the played in fancy dress. Which tells you like how seriously it was taken at that time. Well, wasn't wasn't there the story of um, they went to the toss and I, whoever won, the, I think it was Surrey won the toss, and Adam Hollyoak said, "I don't know what the hell's going to happen, so we're just going to bat." <laughs> well, I think that there was, like I said, there was a the match playing fans just between New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. New Zealand had like wigs on and stuff like that, um, and now it's like the most <laughs> commercially successful format, less than twenty, yeah. years, which kind of tells you about how it's developed, and. If it's developed like that, and these players only played at the start, how can they possibly give you insight over someone who's sits in, even sits in a home office like myself all day long, mm-hmm. looking at data, historical trends, drivers of success, recruitment information, stuff like that? They can't. No. And, and obviously, as you as you know, the benefit of of data and analytics is that you can cover multiple matches all at the same time, whereas if you're watching a match live or on TV, you can only cover one match at the same time. And in not, a lot of the time in cricket, there's multiple matches played at the same time. So you've got no chance to cast as many eyes on it as you possibly can, yeah. whereas you can, you can use some data and video and stuff like that. So I so say these ex-players, they, they hold too much weight. They um, There's still a big reliance on overpaid declining legends in terms of the, the in squads so if you look at a couple of teams in the IPL I've, I've just been doing some IPL previews for another podcast a cricket podcast so if anyone's interested in the IPL in advance definitely give those a lesson as well, a I'll listen put, as well I'll put a link down below Perfect. yeah the first one's being released on Wednesday the 
31st of March and they're being released daily. So yeah, if you're interested, give those a listen. So what I'm saying says Chennai Super Kings and, and Kolkata Knight Riders, they have a very aging squad with a, a lot of big pl- big name players aged sort of 34 plus. Even CSK have got one player, Imran Tahir, is 42. They have been around um, forever. Yeah, MS Domini, like I think he's about 39, roughly. Uh, and CSK have, I mean, if, if you're 32, you're you're a youngster, you're a break, breakthrough player for them. <laughs> it, it, and, and these players are paid, paid huge money despite like declining data. And, but because they're like legends of Indian cricket, they still, they, they, they can't bring themselves to get rid of these players. No. And then I see like today, for example, Sergio Aguero has been released by, by Man City. And I tweeted this morning and I said, football teams can grasp the economics of player decline a lot better than cricket teams can right now. Yeah. And, and cricket teams, there is a bit of FOMO, I think, that they don't want to release a legend and then he plays well for someone else. But what's the bigger risk? The bigger risk surely is releasing, uh, uh, you know, keeping a player on, paying him fortunes, a massive chunk of your budget. And then flops. They're basically rubbish, yeah, yeah, which happens so many times. So there's a lot of things that cricket needs to learn from football, I think, at the moment, in terms of how they deal with things from like that age decline and economic basis as well. Okay, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, you touched on, you know, obviously the the squad profile and that that fear of letting people go. I think I think that's only just started to change a little bit in football. Um, I do think that has been a, a massive problem in that as well. Um, I've seen, I'm an Everton fan, uh, regular listeners will know, and we've signed huge contracts to players aged 28, 29, 30 yeah. over the last few seasons and just really throw money up against the wall in the hope that they'll produce what they did when they were 23, 24, 25 at the same level now, having moved to a different league, uh, playing in a different system. And it, it just doesn't, scream long-term thinking yeah um, which is a a real shame actually and um, so i guess moving on from that quite nicely um we were going to talk about a couple of specific things you like to talk about in in cricket and how they might apply to football so i, I guess aging curves would make the most sense to uh to start with and and you were saying to me before you don't see a lot of work on on aging curves in cricket but how just how crucial do you think they are yeah, I think that it's huge because one, as far as I know, I don't know anyone else who's done any work on it. So if you can do work on it and you can do it well, then that's just a ridiculous advantage. But also in terms of understanding how good a young player can be and what what looking at benchmarks for certain ages, like we spoke about earlier, is is really useful because you know, you might get a 19-year-old who's averaging 25 in Division 2, okay? Now, if you're... That 20, 25 in Division 2 is a batting average is not good. It's not it's not a disaster, but it's not good. But if you're 19 and you're averaging 25 over the whole season, you've played every match, that's actually probably pretty good. So, but but so there's, it enables you to make context of, of before, player performance levels. So, you know, young players in cricket are very treat, treated very much differently to football teams so football teams because you've got transfer fees they're treated as an asset they try and sign them up on long-term contracts to maximize resale value but in cricket it's the opposite these players are like an afterthought they're frequently offered like one year deals at the end of a season and stuff like that so then just roll it roll it over for the next year and then just they'll just delay making a decision on their development and their pathway and, and how they're going to fit into the squad and stuff like that and and an understanding that a player with a below average performance output at a young age will, will then be able to transform that into an above average output at a higher level when their peak age is yeah. massive and and enables you to to pick up and exploit mistakes on on a lot of young players at other teams and yeah i've got i've got like metrics which will tell me that if if a player hits a certain level by a certain age, they're like 80% likely to play for England. Stuff like that because of his, the way the historical trends have gone. Yeah. But, and and we've already, I don't really want to talk about it in that much depth, but we've already picked up one player who's done that. So, so 
that particular player, very, very few people had under, uh, outperformed him at his age uh, in, that, in a particular format in the last five or six years. And out of all those players who outperformed him, they've all either played for England or England Lions, which is like England A team. So like the fringing, they'll be fringing England players. So the, when when his his team are not that interested in keeping him, and we can then come in and get a player like that, that's just huge. Yeah. Because because and that just goes to show you how teams undervalue players in cricket and undervalue young players. A lot of teams don't have a clear pathway for young player development. So classic case is a right arm off spinner in cricket, right? So I guess there's probably parallels with, with certain positions in, in football as well, where there's a sort of ridiculous oversupply and under demand for certain positions, but then yeah. there's other positions where it's the opposite. Um, like a right arm off spinner in cricket, right? I can, if I want to write a moth spinner, I can go to a release list and pick up one like that because there's so many, there's an oversupply of them. But the problem is, you don't really want to write a moth spinner because most of the time, because a right arm moth spinner only really matches up well against left handed batsmen because of the angle of turn, right? So the problem is, is that over 70% of batters are right handed. Yes. So you, you only really, there's not really that much need for a right arm off spinner unless the opposition have got like a really left hander heavy like say like four left handers or three left handers in the top six or seven um and so if you look at the players who are currently at counties in england who are right arm off spinners you'll find that the vast majority of them are either elite level like simon harmer they either bat really well like moe nally or joe root they either or they're above they're an above average batter for a bowler like Dominic Best, which is Best. probably his yep. pathway into the England team to some extent. Um, or they've got like massive potential, like Amar Verdi uh, at Surrey is 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 one example of that. So so apart from that, there's no pathway for these players to develop. So you've either got to be elite or a good batter, basically, to, to be a right arm spin and get a long-term county success. But what teams do is that they they pick up these players in their academy, they spend money on developing them, they put them on rookie contracts when they're like 18, then they'll string them along for a year, year after year after year until they're about 22, realise that they don't actually need a right off spin and release them and they spend about 100 grand plus on, on, on their development for no, no ROI. Uh, and it's just completely pointless. And... Like I said, if, if I want to pick up a 22 right, right, I'm off, 20 year old right arm off spinner now, I could go and do it immediately. But if you asked me to find a 22 year old leg spinner, I couldn't do it. Gold dust, yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I, I can relate to that. I, I was a, well, I still am an off, I'm off spinner, and um, I used to play district level, so the level kind of just below um, county Colts. And I, I got dropped from the district team because they didn't want a spinner who couldn't bat. Like my batting is. Yeah. not great compared to my bowling and we were playing on, on green tracks and they just wanted to pick four seamers instead and because I couldn't bat I, I literally just couldn't hold a place in the team and I was still picking up wickets um for my local team but they just didn't want an off spinner in the district team so yeah, I think that's really the perfect analogy there definitely and, and you, see, you see you see it all the time it just there's no there's just not a place for it a bowler like that in, in particularly in T20 as well, because the, a lot of the time a right arm off spinner's economy against a right hand batsman is horrible or they don't take wickets mm -hmm. and, and they just get, get dominated really, really easily. And you look at IPL, every team has got a leg spinner who's pretty much, apart from Kings 11, I think, but they have a, a leg spinner who's an elite level leg spinner and sometimes two, but most of them probably won't even pick an off spinner in there in the starting 11. Yeah, and I think there was the thing kind of with England um, going back to the mid-2010s, a desperate search to find anyone who could bowl a bit of legs been with people like Scott Barthwick and even picking Joe Denley on the basis that he bowled some some leg spin. It was that desperate for a search to find those yeah. players. I can't off the top of my head think of any or many examples in football. I think the, the only current trend that I think that matches up to it is there's a massive trend in football at the moment for, for left-footed um, centre-halves. Okay, um, yeah. And there's just this big rush that if you're playing 
a back two or a back three, regardless, people want left footed centre backs and they'll pigeonhole um, sometimes defensive midfielders to play there just because they think it, it creates this um, advantage with the passing angles. But actually, if you look at it, there's not such a huge tangible difference that people should be rushing out and trying to buy every young left footed centre back there is. So I, I, th- I think, yeah, it's that fine line between wanting obviously something that works but not just rushing out and buying it just because it's the the done thing and that happens in in cricket auctions in particular as well so it's a very similar scenario to the left left uh, footed center backs a left arm paces in the ipl auction are ridiculously overpriced because and you, as you say, the stats don't necessarily bear out the fact that they should be overpriced. I, I've done research and all this, and actually, there's t- teams without a left arm pacer have actually performed pretty well. Um, there's uh, the, the a lot of teams. What's happened is that they, they pick a left arm pacer because they've overpaid by so much, and they've got a fixed budget. Every team's got the same budget. It's quite different to football, where every team in in the IPL, every team's got a level budget of eighty yeah. quarters. So. Um, 80 core is about 8 million pounds for a salary for a six week tournament, for example, squad salary. And um, if, you, if you're paying like 12 crore, which is essentially about 15% of your budget for a left arm pacer who's an average bowler, but because he's left arm, you're paying that left arm premium that people often refer to, you're then sort of hamstringing yourself in other areas of your squad because you can't compete financially to get the best players yeah. in other, other skill sets and, and, and you see it all the time that mediocre left arm paces are picked up for massive money and I'm not convinced of the rationale behind that and like you say sometimes the stats don't bear out the obsession with a certain playing role Yeah, and, and I think this is another area where like ex-players have too much influence in team building a lot of the time because an ex-player will almost always say you've got to pick up a, you've got to pick a left armor you have to pick a left arm a different angle well there's no good buying a mediocre left armor for a load of money when you can pick a better right armor for half the price yeah so yeah that's a, that's a, a lot of the sort of less successful teams have there's been a history of spending overspending on left arm seamers yeah, and I, I think that just comes back to a trend that I've kind of discussed and had debates with people on in football before is about that fundamental difference between style and talent and where the crossover is and actually how far down that style track just to fit in with how you want to play and how different you want your options to be, how far down that road you want to go before you realise, actually, I've missed out on all these fundamentally more talented players along the way just to kind of fit into this mold that I've got my mind set on. I think it's a really, really interesting debate. There's some good articles about it online and I think it'll become more prevalent. I think the shift will go back towards that. Let's let's make sure we've got the best talent we can mm. before worrying about, oh, we've got to have everything um, that's on trend. Um, I think then that also leads quite nicely into the next thing we wanted to discuss, which was, um, matchups. Um, I think it's it's quite a buzzword. Whenever I watch um, T Twenty cricket on on Sky, they're always talking about all oh, the matchups. Are um, Moe and Ali's such a, a good hitter against spin or whatever? Mm-hmm. Do you think they are becoming more and more crucial to the fine margins um, that that decide a T Twenty game? I do, but I don't think a lot of people approach them very well. So. Um... To give you an example, like you use the Moe and Ali example there. Um, so obviously that's that's very true. Moe Mo is a great uh, hitter of spin. Um, but there's three different types of conventional spin. Yeah. So slow left arm, right arm off spin, or, or right arm leg spin. There's a, some some left arm leg spinners, but they probably represent less than 5% of the, of the spinner pool. Um, uh, but... So then you can break that up into sub-segments of, of different spin type. And and so when, but when a player is, I mean, you're lucky to get a strike rate against spin or flashing up on your TV when a player comes into bat. And I think that that's, that's a big problem. And we talked earlier about the poker sample sizes. 
And I think that that's, that's a massive thing with matchups as well, because you see even like media companies on, on Twitter and stuff and people who even involve, you know, advise teams, then they're like, oh, I don't know, just plucking some random names out of the air. Virat Kohli has scored 35 runs in 27 balls against Jasper Brumrah. Well, what predictive value does that have? It's 27 balls. Yeah. That's like nothing, absolutely nothing. True. So that you know, ballpark 130 strike rate off for 35 to 27 balls, right? How confident can you be that in the next 27 balls, he's going to strike at 130 strike rate again? You can't be because yeah. the target sample is so tiny. So matchups are crucial. They're really, really useful for a marginal gain or not even a marginal gain, a massive competitive okay. advantage if you do it right. But you've got to do it right. And and understanding the drawbacks of small sample sizes a lot. To put, it, to put this into context, I don't I, I do an absolute ton of work with matchups. And I don't think I ever look at individual batter v bowler matchups. It's always a subset of similar players. Yeah, it's a certain kind of type of yeah. batter or bowler or whatever. Exactly, yeah. So, so I'm not I'm not looking at Kohli versus Jasper Brumra. I'm I'm looking at Kohli versus bowlers who are similar to Jasper Brumra, and then we can get a more robust sample size to draw some conclusions which may have better predictive value. Yeah, I think that's quite important. I mean, sample sizes is, is talked about a lot in football as well now, especially with young players. And like you say, it's in football. It seems to be a thing now where if it's a small sample size, oh, we'll just we'll just chuck them out, we'll ignore them, we won't include them in our analysis. Whereas I think the the trend which you've kind of spoken about there and something I try to do with um you, you know using the historical prize that we've talked about and a little bit of you know things like regression towards the mean is rather than just focusing on that small sample size, can we use similar players in the past? Um and a wider rather than just that individual a wider group who are similar so we don't have to chuck out that sample size and we yeah. can perhaps nudge our confidence a little bit more into how this might translate um out over over the longer term and I, I think you've you've touched on it quite well that it's less about those individual matchups and more talking about how they perform maybe against a certain subset or uh, against a certain style and then we can we can up our confidence but I don't think it makes sense to to chuck them out altogether. It's just about including m- more information that's still relevant. Yeah, definitely. Completely. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like you say, yeah, you talk about it's not just a marginal gain anymore. It's um, you know, it, it can be it can be game winning. And um, what um, without obviously going into too many of the specifics, is there anything? you look at apart from you know there's the batter bowler type matchups um obviously t20 is quite situational so is there anything yeah. else teams look to look to exploit in those batter bowler matchups yeah um so having well, it's all about team building this it all goes back to recruitment and team building so for example <coughs> some, some bowlers will only bowl in certain phases of matches so uh Give me some examples. So m- many leg spinners don't bowl in the power play and rarely bowl at the death. So power play is over one to six in T20 match. Death, I call it 17 to 20, uh, over 17 to 20, so the last four. Some people say 16 to 20 for the last five, but I, I'm very strong on the fact that it's, I think it's 17 to 20. There's not really a dictionary definition of it. But the reason why I say 17 to 20 is because then you've got Two in if you have good roll clarity, you've got two bowlers, one bowling 17, 19, the other bowl 18 and 20, your yeah. your go-to death bowlers. Um and just and, to just to clarify for anyone who isn't yeah. okay with cricket power play, um means there are there are fielding restrictions, so you can only have um two fielders out on the boundary during the power plays. Yeah, and uh going on from that, a lot of spinners bowl 16th over, whereas they won't bowl 17 to 20. So that's another reason why I like um using 17 to 20 as death overs a bracket mm-hmm. anyway so um so for example matt parkinson who's kind of on the fringe of the the england team and there's a leg spinner that i rate rate pretty highly um he doesn't he barely ever bowls in the power play whereas uh, as a leg spinner uh whereas max waller who's a sunset will bowl 
quite a bit in the power play. He often opens the bowling. Matt, Matt Parkinson's twin brother, Callum, is with us at Leicestershire. He's a slow left arm spinner and he'll bowl multi phases. So, multi phases, he'll bowl power play or middle primarily. Um, so, the point I'm trying to make is, is that when you're building a team, you've got to understand where you're going to get the, the phase output from for those matchups as well. So, um, I look to try, I prefer, I prefer to, to focus on bowlers who have multi-phase output, positive expectation for multi-phase output. So in, if you can find a bowler who's got positive expectation from three-phase output, that's fantastic because then it just allows you so much with planning flexibility and, and, and to really target and dial down on those matchups. Whereas if a lot of the time people make mistakes on picking certain players who are good players but they're only really good in one phase as a bowler but the problem is you've got four over quota and you, you're pigeonholing yourself so um i'll give you some examples so like last year in the ipl i felt that royal challengers bangalore had too many pace bowlers who are strong one phase operators so the they'll often bowl two overs in either the power play or the death Primarily the death with their, with their group of players that had a lot of good death bowlers, but those players didn't have great output in the power play or the middle over. So their, their role clarity of death was fine. They'll bowl two overs at the death, but then where do you get their other two overs around? Yeah. Uh, and that's really difficult. So you're you're taking a hit in other areas, which is unnecessary because there's actually players who went unsold who who provide multi-phase output. So it's all about planning the matchups is all about team building and planning and finding players who complement each other so in t if you're if you're in a draft or an auction it's particularly in an auction i think in the ipl when you have a 25 player squad which is massive in terms of flexibility if you don't have multiple leg two leg spinners at least at least one slow left armor and at least one off spinner but the off spinner will almost certainly have to come out of your top six batters because they're, they're a good batter as well. If you don't have that in your squad, you probably failed in team build because then you can you can have really flexible strategy and, and team balance and flexibility from those multiple options. Mm -hmm. So you you might you might the off spinner might not bowl against some teams, but then against a team full of left-handers, they might bowl four overs. So it's you, you're allowing them options, and I think that having those those bowling options in the top six out of the top six batters is 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 quite a crucial bit of strategy for matchups. And and if you notice the teams that I work with, that's kind of a common denominator. It's really really interesting to hear that, and I I guess it goes back to the name that I gave this whole podcast when I first started, it looks good on paper. Like sometimes the best players that you can pick aren't necessarily the ones that will gel the most. And I, I get infuriated a lot of the time when people say, Oh, this is our, this is our best 11. Cause I think your best 11 can only be your best 11 for any specific game. You can't just pick the same team over and over and expect the same results. There's always going to be nuances with the opposition that you're playing. Um, and other factors yeah. that are going to be factored into it that are going to mean you're going to have to make changes in selection. And people do, people get mad when managers make um, changes to the teams um, on a game by game basis. But it's absolutely crucial to exploit those little edges that you can game depending on who the opposition are, are going to select. Do you think that's completely true in cricket as well? Yeah, completely. Like, no doubt about that. So I think I heard a phrase once, which was, I don't want to pick the 11 best players. I want to pick the best 11 for the match. And and, and that's, I couldn't agree more with that. So we've, in cricket, obviously, you've, you've got a very opposition-dependent strategy that you can exploit if you want to try and go down that road. Um, I don't know about football planning, but I would guess that cricket is probably, you can structure up differently, probably more in cricket, against certain opposition you can in football because there's also the extra variable of the venue as well so i don't know let's just look at two two venues as complete contrast okay if you look at trent bridge nottingham and uh, nottingham now that that's a, what you would call a high par venue so if you're batting first your your target is going to be like 180 plus most of the time because in t20 i'm talking about because the boundaries aren't the biggest 
and not have got a really good batting lineup. So you have to post a high total batting first to get, keep yourself in the game. Whereas if you go to Durham, a Chesterler Street, the dynamics are completely different. Durham don't have such a, a strong batting group as, as Knotts, but the boundaries are huge as well. So against not, a Knotts, you might pick a team of hitters because you can need to pepper them with boundaries because that's the only way you're going to beat them. Where against Durham, you might pick players who are better at rotating the strike because boundaries are much harder to hit. So you might just look to try and, yeah, you know, Durham, you might look to hit like 12, 13% of boundaries, but you would really want to maximise your non-boundary strike rate. So like, say, say you hit 12, 13 boundaries and 120 balls, it's like 15, 16 boundaries and 120 balls, right? Mm-hmm. So off those other 105 odd balls, you would want to score like minimum of 80 of those balls. Yeah. But then you're, but then against knots, you wouldn't be worried about rotating the strike and so much. You'd be more looking at getting the ball over the boundary line, whether it's a four or a six, because there's completely different dynamics of the venue and completely different dynamics of the opposition. So you would want to change your strategy based on that. And you saw that at the IPL as well. Uh, I don't know if you watch much of it, but like Sharjah, they played they played all the games in UAE last last year because of COVID, and um, they played a lot of the matches were at Sharjah. Now Sharjah is about as big as my back garden, so so like the scores were ridiculously high. But then if you if you at the other two venues, it wasn't nearly as prevalent yeah. that kind of thing, and that suits different players. Like Avira Kohli, for example, he he is an unpopular point of view, but it's 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 you can't argue against it statistically. Out of all the batters who faced a minimum of 150 balls in the IPL last year, Coley had the lowest boundary percent by a mile. Okay, he, and his game is that's his game over a long sample size, a big sample size, long period of time. It's that's exactly it. He has a low boundary percentage, but his um, non-boundary strike rate, so his ability to rotate the strike and turn ones into twos, is like the best you'll you'll see. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he takes. He's a very low risk player. He 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 preserves his wicket arguably too much, but but he he will try and bat through an innings. And you, we saw that in the T um, twenties recently yeah. against England. Um, but against Sharjah, his style of play is arguably unsuited to that venue because you need to score like two hundred plus. I mean, two I think two twenty five odd got chased down in one match, uh, and. If it, Coley is a master of getting your team to 160, his team to 160, but he's not the master of getting his team to 220. Yeah, and, and, and that's what that's it. So if, he, if the other venues, he was a positive player in my opinion, but at Sharjah he, he could turn from being a positive player into potentially a liability. So it's very venue driven as well, and and, and understanding those venue venue dynamics which is something that I do a lot of work on as well and I do like an advanced scouting pack for the teams that I work for with all that type of yeah. information and then both data wise and like bullet points and stuff with potential strategies that we can we can adapt to that venue and stuff but I think that's critical in cricket yeah that's, that's really interesting to hear obviously it's kind of sacrilege saying stuff like that about Virat Kohli but <laughs> I think I think you're absolutely right in that sometimes even the very best players are just not the ones that are suited to that situation yeah. and like you say it's about understanding those little nuances it's something that i'm trying to kind of incorporate into some of our predictive modeling is things like um crowd sizes so i think that different players respond well to venues with different uh, size capacities um you know bigger or, or smaller crowd sizes and how that that scales up with player talent and also just things like measuring expectations. Like if you've got a, a really good goal scorer and he, he's playing against, he's playing, sorry, in a team where there's four or five other goal scorers. I wrote an article on this recently. You can't expect him to scale the output from when he, if he's coming from a team where he was the, the sole goal scorer to one where he's now one of many points of attack because he, he's just not going to have as, as much time on the ball to create yeah. those goals. And I think leveling those expectations, understanding how a player fits within your own team and also how they fit against the opposition that you're playing, I still think has a, a long way to go in football and, and hopefully the wheels start to turn slowly on that and we can see more matchup based um, team selections in the future. Um, so I think the next 
the next topic to discuss is something that's fascinated me ever since I, I started watching American sports, maybe five, six years ago, is um, the 100 draft. Um, obviously, for anyone who, who doesn't know, the 100 was a, a new format that the ECB came up with, and it's it is what it says on the tin. It, it's a 100-ball competition. It's never been played before. I guess my first question would be, what was planning for that like knowing you were going into a format of cricket that's not been played yet? Yeah, fun, real challenge. I loved it. Um, yeah. So, so obviously, 100 balls isn't that much different to 120, which you face in, in T20. Unfortunately, um, there's also a T10 competition played in, in the UAE every, every year as well. And so, 100 isn't quite between 120 balls for T20 and 60 balls for T10, but it's kind of somewhere along that scale. Yeah. So so I, I kind of prepared a little bit on, on looking at the differences between those two formats and similarities between those two formats on, on what drove success. And yeah, that was quite useful. But then there's going to be a lot of different scenarios that, that are quite difficult to account for in advance as well. So, for example bowlers can bowl back-to-back overs in, in the 100, which has never been done before in T20 cricket. So, yeah, that's going to be something that we're probably going to have to learn about, about on, you know, a bit on the fly, really, to start yeah. with, because there's no historical evidence that we can go and look at for to see how teams have dealt with those situations before. I've got some ideas on how, how I think would be a good way to go about that scenario, but... They're just ideas rather than concrete strategies and you know proven strategies, if you like. Um, but I mean, I think mo- you'd say that most teams in the draft prepared for it as if it was a T20 comp. I don't, with with a kind of a leaning towards picking more aggressive batters uh, slightly. So you saw in the original draft, like a few of the more sort of accumulators, if you like, were picked up at lower price brackets than perhaps people predicted would that they would go for. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that maybe surprised a few people, but I actually think that was quite logical too. That's just market forces, obviously. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that there's going to be an absolute ton of similarities between the 100 and T20, but I'm super excited with the new format. I think it's going to be a massive success as well because – there's quite a few reasons why things can be huge and the first the first reason is is that at the moment we've got 18 counties in english cricket and most of the matches that they play are all played at the same time right so compared to football in the old days you might have had like all all 10 teams in the premier league playing at three o'clock on a saturday yeah. afternoon. um in cricket that's often the case like this might be sort of five six seven eight matches all played at the same time you can't watch all those matches at the same time, obviously, on TV because it's physically impossible to do yeah. that. And so one match out of them, eight or so, might be televised. Well, that's no good if you're looking to get exposure as a player, is it? Because you can't... You, there'll be some, some players might only be on TV once or twice in the entire tournament. Yeah. And a lot of these overseas franchise teams, they, they have kind of a view, a mentality where if it's, if it's on TV, it didn't happen. If it's not on TV, it didn't happen. Yeah. And someone, someone said to me the other day, not a player said to me the other day, oh, well, your TV runs can't double. And, and like, it does, that's, that's so true. If you get like, if you score a hundred or an 80 on TV or take five wickets or something on TV, I guarantee you that you'll be very, very likely to get like a, hun- uh, a contract in a draft or something like that. Ha- happens in football as well. World, World Cup and European Championship yeah. goals just blow transfer values completely out of the water. Yeah, yeah. I can remember, was it Paborski at Man United? Carol Paborski and Jordi yeah. Cruyff in the uh, yeah. year 96, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, that, that's, that's super prevalent in cricket as well. And um, the other thing is as well is that at the moment with 18 teams, there's like 198 players on the pitch at any one time. Yeah. Whereas the 100 is 88 players, eight teams, with, eight teams with 11. So it, there's a big dilution of quality with an 18 county format. Whereas now with the 100, with fewer teams, it's more of a concentrated area of talent. Three overseas players as well who works 
extremely high quality across all the teams. So the, the standard of cricket is going to be very, very, very high. And I would say, would I, in advance, I would predict it will be of a similar standard to the IPL, which is the best T20 league in yeah. the world. Pretty much everyone would say that. Um, so uh, I think that it's going to be a massive success. And the fact that every game is being televised, also on, a lot of it's going to be on free-to-air TV yeah. as well, is is going to be huge for the profile. We've also seen that the, that the women's competition is is being played alongside it as well, with often men's and women's double headers. So I think that's going to be great for the growth of the the women's game as well mm -hmm. so so this is so many positives around the tournament it's it's the tournament's really annoyed traditionalists but so did t20 when it came came along and now everyone watches it now yeah 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 i think you made a really good point on the um the dilution of talent there that's one of the reasons i'm really into the nba is because yeah. you've got you've got 30 teams and there's five spots on each team and it just creates the most um, saturated talent pool. And you really see the very best playing uh, against the very best. And like you say, it really does make for such um, a more exciting sport at the end of the day. And um, yeah. so going, going into that, that draft, you've got such this, this wide player pool to pick from, I guess. And like yeah. I said before, there's no real, there's a no real parallel in football in terms of the format. But if you're a Premier League football club, you literally have your pick of pretty much any footballer in the world to sign on 90% on of them. Mm -hmm. And it's about whittling down that player pool. So I guess how much of a challenge did you find that? And did you feel you, you had an edge going into that on some of the other franchises perhaps? Yeah. Um, so this is where I feel like being data driven is of a real benefit because while they didn't circulate the draft list until quite late in the day in terms of you know, not not far off the draft date. I, I knew that which players were going to be involved. It's obvious which players were going to be yeah. the next forward. So you could do all the due diligence on the players from data side of things in advance. So so yeah, we obviously we did some really thorough planning and had a lot of meetings about about the strategies that we were looking to try and try and develop through the squad and the squad dynamics that we wanted. And and data featured pretty heavily in that. Um, uh both to kind of prove and disprove theories and stuff like that so so um it i couldn't have done that without the data the data side of it was huge in terms of at least creating some form of short list of players who who we would be interested in come draft day so i'm trying to think how many players there were. I, I bought a guess ballpark there would have been about 300 domestic players and a lot of overseas players who would put put their name in, and that's that's actually uh, I think the IPL has about a thousand players that are whittled down to about three hundred in advance of the auction. Yeah. But the thing is, with a lot of them, you can just draw a line through them straight away. Like some players that you know that like if they're in the list, but they've probably got about as much chance of being picked up as me and you. Yeah. So so that that helps too. Um, but yeah, the, having the data of every player and understanding what type of player you're looking for enables you to to do some a lot of data filters and and almost like a, a bit of a depth chart kind of thing to to work out which players offer the most value in certain areas. So having having my own database again was something that was was super useful. Um, with the draft as well, it was it was quite a complicated process because I don't know if, if you're familiar with this or your listeners will be familiar with this, but we used a snake draft, which is quite I think quite uh, prevalent in in fantasy sports in in America. Yeah, we so we do our we do a draft every every Monday on our podcast with different criteria, and we we use a snake draft on that. Yeah, well, you probably know then that. If you're first or last, that is quite a disadvantage. I think being first is probably the biggest disadvantage. I, I'm, when we do it, whoever gets first normally actually complains because they're just okay. waiting for ages once they've had that first pick. Well, um, I we were last. Yeah. I thought that was a big disadvantage over the first. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. And I felt that that, that that was quite a considerable disadvantage over the draft. So if considering we were last I, I was really really pleased with the squad that 
that we picked. And then they reversed the order this year for the for the, the mini draft, so we were first. And mm -hmm. it, because it was a mini draft, we, it was a lot easier being first. Let me tell you, um, we we got we got what we got pretty much what we wanted. So so yeah, it was the dynamics of the draft are you have to take that into account. And I knew that I, I'd done some research on snake drafts in advance of, of the draft of, of the hundred. And um, it still took me by surprise how kind of biased that format was towards teams who were sort of in the middle of the snake, if you like. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I knew it wouldn't, it would favor them, but I didn't quite know how much it would favor them. Yeah. I mean, we've, we, we have experimented with kind of snake drafts and also the more um, NFL NBA type drafts where you'll go kind of one through six and then two will start the second round, the third person will start and you'll loop around like that. And it's been interesting to see how the, the dynamics of those different draft types changed. I mean, in the, in the first round, obviously, like you said, you were last We Did you kind of know who would have gone from the 17s before and you were banking on your first two picks and you knew who was probably going to fall to you by then, or was it still mm. a bit of a stab in the dark? No, no, I think that, that we probably knew at least half of the players who would be likely to go before us. Because you know that like it's not it's not a secret that players like Rashid Khan. Uh, yeah, I think everyone knew he was probably yeah. gonna go first yeah. or second. Yeah. So so you know that they're gonna get picked up straight away. So I mean it, 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 I think going last, being an eighth team, if someone like Rashid Khan or Andre Russell fell to you, you would like you would fall off your chair in shock. Yeah. yeah, like you, you wouldn't expect that at all. So yeah, that, that's one of the advantages to going first to some extent, I suppose, or towards the top. Yeah, definitely. And then, like you say, you, you reversed the order for the mini draft this year. Um, you said you've got the the data driven process in place. I I did laugh actually a couple of times when I watched the the original one because you had the podiums and you had the coach uh, and the assistant and some of them had an analyst and when they were discussing the picks you'd see the two coaches um heads together picking a player and you just kind of see the analyst sat to the side and <laughs> not not really involved in the decision yeah. making I, I don't know if that was just for show or or how prevalent that was but watching through it, and obviously you had the the pricing bands as well and players had to had to nominate themselves at, uh, at the the minimum that. pricing band yeah um, did that kind of throw a spanner into the works at any stage? Okay, so from our perspective, so we weren't one of those teams who were the, the coach. We only had one coach in our pod. So Andrew McDonald, who's our head coach, couldn't make it over from Australia. So um, so he was on like Zoom. And yeah. um, we had Dan Vittori, who's our assistant coach in our pod. And we also had Craig, who's our, our general manager as well. Yeah. So, so we had a different approach in terms of the people in the pod to most other, other teams who, some of them didn't even have an analyst, but you're right, some some of them did. I, I, yeah, I was thinking more the, yeah. the teams on the left-hand side. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that, that was, particularly. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm pretty sure a couple of them, or one at least, didn't have an analyst in their pod as well. Yeah. yeah um so yeah that was that was that was interesting and yeah well, so what was the second point part of that? mine's gone uh, was the um did the reserve players setting their um reserve prices oh, yeah. to a spanner of the works at any stage um yeah not to us but i think to other teams maybe um well, i think that some players had got bad advice from their agents and they they put their reserve at like say 50 or 60k and that dramatically impacted on on their demand because yep. um, you're forcing a team's hand, obviously, at that point because you know you get down to the 60k bracket and you're saying, well, if you don't pick me up now, I'm not getting a contract, and the team might have like FOMO or they might or the player might not get a contract, and that actually happened on quite a few yeah yeah quite a few players. Now those players ended up getting picked up in the redraw. But if the tournament hadn't have been postponed due to COVID, they would have missed out on the tournament of the first year. And they missed out, would have missed out on all the exposure that that tournament would have brought, not just domestically, but also overseas as well. Yeah. I'm sure the tournament would have been broadcast in India and Australia and the major cricketing nations. So um, there would have been huge interest in the tournament. So I think any player that put themselves in, domestic players I'm talking about, who put themselves in at 
at any reserve price apart from no reserve was getting bad advice from their agent to be pretty honest with you yeah i agree because like you say you, you saw some kind of mid to high profile names just not getting picked up and yeah. but then you saw someone a, you know a t20 veteran like luke right i think went in the last the last pick yeah. maybe last pick, yeah yeah, um, which is really interesting. Um, you know, that's been a really good insight, I think, into the drafting. I really wish there was more of a something like a drafting process in football. I don't think it worked because of how the league pyramid works. Yeah, I watched the Major League Soccer draft in America um, last year, but it'd be interesting to see how something like that would work in English football. Really yeah, I, I do as well, because I just think there'd be such a, a disconnect between some of the switched on clubs and let's say those who are, are less so. Um, I'd just like to, to finish with a question we got in um, from one of the people on Twitter. I put out a thing for questions. Um, and Alec asked about fielding. Um, and he said there's a lot more in football about looking at average positions and, and formations and structures. And he said there's, there's not a lot of that in cricket. Um, obviously, on, on Sky, you get the occasional... Uh, graphic with the little dots representing where yeah. the field is and sometimes you'll you'll see them moving is that a big part of any of your analysis or is, is fielding a forgotten afterthought sometimes in cricket do you think yeah um I've, i'm a bit contrasted in terms of my my point of view on this so i don't look at fielding but that's because i don't have the technology to yeah. to immerse myself in that side of things and my plate's full with other things anyway. But, sure. but, but um, I think that it's probably the next area which we'll, we'll see kind of more innovation with. But I'm unconvinced about how much value that will have in terms of anything being anything more than a very marginal gain. Mm-hmm. So I know that like, some of the stats companies who, who use with Sky and stuff, they sometimes put um, tables on the screen with like the best fielding performances uh, in a tournament or the average runs saved per fielder in a tournament. And in T20, it's extremely rare to find a player saving more than one run in over 120 balls. Yeah. Uh, I think only based on... I read an article uh, in newspaper uh, online last week, and I think there's only about five or six players who saved on average of over a, a run, run uh, in a match in T20. Uh, and from that, you can probably infer that the the worst field is probably leak, maybe one, two runs max um, as a negative as well. Yeah. So that doesn't really make fielding anything more than a line call in terms of selection. Um, Certainly, I think that's another area where I think a lot of traditionalists would be quite surprised at the limited impact of, of players in the field in T20. And some, you you will get coaches who will say, oh, well, yeah, but he's a good fielder. Well, he, having a good fielder is only useful if they're an above average player in their primary skill set. Already. Yeah, I guess it's more of a, a nice thing to have on, exactly. on the side rather than that being the primary reason why yeah. they're, they're well, getting that's selected. The line call, like, if you've got two players of similar batting ability, for example, and one's a better fielder, you go with a better fielder. It's, it, but it's certainly not something that I would want to factor in too much in my my planning unless someone was like overwhelmingly bad at, at fielding. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, like they're overweight and they can't move properly in the field. They've got, you know, they, they're not, they're not a good asset in the field, if you like. That 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 might be one example, but I would never. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, you just froze there a little bit. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so I wouldn't really ever factor that side of things in as much. I think it's an overrated area yeah. of tradition coaches and stuff i think i think that what you've said there just falls perfectly in line with what um happened in moneyball in in baseball and how it's progressed fielding has advanced in that but in money he would get rid of he would sign sorry uh billy bean would sign below average fielders because they were really good hitters and he saw that the the gains that you were getting hitting far outweighed the the net loss that you were getting in the field and it was just exactly. more of a nice bonus and 
uh, while there isn't kind of a, a direct parallel in football that I, I can think of, um, people sometimes get concerned about, oh, uh, is, a de- is a defender going to score enough goals for us or is a striker going to defend? And I think people need to worry more about who's the better player in the primary skill set. And then if it's neck and neck, then you can look towards more of a secondary skill set as, as more of a tiebreaker. Yeah, couldn't um, be more. Yeah, and, and there's that's so uh, it's a very similar comparison between cricket with fielding and, and you know, baseball that we have yeah. we read about in Moneyball already. Yeah. Okay, um, Dan, this has been a, a really interesting episode for me uh, to listen to what you've got to say. I, I hope everyone who's listened ha- has found it the same. Um, really interesting to hear about parallels from other sports. Hopefully, a, a few of you have listened are interested in cricket and. Some of the cricket listeners might be interested in football as well. Um, so thank you for your time. If anyone wants to um, read some of Dan's older work, I'll put a, a link to the Sports Analytics Advantage website down below. Um, and you can follow Dan on Twitter. Um, I think it's at SA Advantage on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so Dan, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.